analysts and no attendees yet. Do we need to start the webinar at the top no, there, no. Alistair? I think I think you've got to wait until there's a disclaimer put up, and once that disclaimer clears, and then we get the views of us too, that's when you start talking. Okay, because at the moment there's no attendees. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's only only eighteen hundred hours. Okay. But we could be, we could be live on YouTube, um, so people might be, folks might be watching us on YouTube. Okay, so at the top of my screen says it's you're in a practice session and then you need to click on start webinar. Do I need to click that or? No, I think that. Um, um, no, no, please don't worry about that. I will start the webinar. Um, we are literally just about started in, in less than a minute. Okay. Okay, Alistair, I see 108 people have joined us so far. So it's six o'clock now and our webinar is scheduled for six uh, seven o'clock, so between seven and eight. So um, good evening, everyone. My name is Quibus Barnard. Most of you might know me from the work I do for SADA as the dental mediator. Uh, thank you very much for joining us tonight on a Thursday, seven o'clock, um, to learn something about difficult interactions with patients. And I'm joined by my esteemed colleague, the legend himself, uh, Dr. Alistair McKelvey from the United Kingdom, who most of you would know as well. Good evening, Alistair. Good evening, Corbus. Uh, less of the legend here, more of the <laughs> more of the, the experienced old hand. But yeah, um, great to be with you tonight, and it's fantastic to be uh, by many many years the oldest person on the show tonight so it's absolutely brilliant and i hope very few of our audience actually know me because if they do know me it may be because of the work i do from dent protection okay great so the plan tonight uh, for alistair and myself is to talk a little bit about difficult interactions uh you you all from the young dentist council so as you get more, ex more experienced in dentistry you, you would know that there are many difficult interactions that you have to deal with uh, daily between patients and yourself but also sometimes between colleagues and tonight's webinar is really just to uh, help you manage these difficult interactions a little bit better in your professional career by looking at um, what contributes to a difficult interaction, but also examining a range of skills that will help you to, to deal with these difficult interactions. Because in the long term, difficult interactions cause stress. And experience tells us that stress uh, contributes to complaints and increase your risk of getting a patient complaint. And that's what we're, why we're going to talk about that. And at this stage, I'm going to hand over to, to Alistair to start our presentation. Thanks, Cobus. You've you've actually done my presentation for me by telling everybody what we're going to talk about tonight. That's brilliant. So I'll just hand back over to you. But no, seriously, we are going to talk about managing difficult interactions. And the, the interaction may be a, a procedure that becomes 
difficult that would not normally present any challenges and the interaction may be um, a conversation uh, that would not normally be difficult but because of a number of uh, interrelating factors the conversation becomes difficult to manage and that may be between you and a patient it may be between you and a member of your staff it may be between you and another professional colleague so we're going to talk about some of the things that cause a difficult interaction and then um, Cobus is going to give you some tips on how to prepare and how to deal with those difficult interactions. And then at the end, we're just going to sit down and, and have a chat and hopefully um, pick up some of the questions that you guys are going to submit during the, the presentation. So there should be uh, a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Don't put any of your questions in the chat, put them in the Q&A function. That's what we want you to do. So, um, I work for Dental Protection. Um, we are the, the world's leading protection organisation for dentists and oral healthcare practitioners. Gobus works for SADA as the dental mediator, and we actually both spend our time helping dentists repair broken relationships with their patients. And it could be a uh, the relationship could be damaged, a simple complaint about a filling that's fallen out to something more complex where um, the, the dentist competency has been undermined by the provision of really poor care or some other form of unprofessional or unethical conduct. So we, we both share a common philosophy and it's to support safe practice by helping you guys avoid problems before they happen. So today's webinar is one of many opportunities you're going to have through your career to see for yourself how we do this, how we provide you with risk management advice and information. So I'm going to talk first about the ingredients that make for a difficult interaction. Um, what, what, what I think that we need to be aware of is we need to be aware of tonight what makes a difficult, an interaction difficult, how to choose your response and how to deal with those difficult conversations with your colleagues. And first of all, let's talk about how common difficult interactions are. Well, when consultations and treatment sessions are not difficult, they usually fall in the comfort zone and we have adequate communication skills, interpersonal skills to cope with these conversations. However, in a difficult encounter, we can actually feel challenged. Sometimes we rise to the challenge and experience the kind of rush of success after those consultations and sometimes our normal skills just don't appear to be enough and we struggle. So many dentists are looking for ways to add to or enhance what they already do and effectively move more consultations from the challenge zone into the comfort zone. The good news is that talk, talking openly about the problem and developing strategies and skills to manage those difficult interactions really does help. And there, there, there are occasions when no matter how skillful you are, you reach the end of the line. You, in effect, you lose the plot. And this rare event can be extremely distressing for both the patient and the dentist. And we've done some surveys of our members, uh, both in the UK and internationally. In 2015, we, we surveyed our UK dentists. And what we found out was that 97% of the dentists we surveyed experienced challenging interactions with their patients. And half of those encountered it monthly and one in three on a weekly basis. So a difficult interaction, whether it's procedural or whether it's conversational, is very common. We did the same survey in 2017 and we had some interesting results because the most friendly place to do your dentistry seems to be Bermuda and the Caribbean, and that's probably got a lot to do with the weather there. But what we found out was that South Africa had the highest frequency of difficult patient interactions reported, and that was double the frequency of the Caribbean. So there's an average, worldwide average, of about 50% of dentists experience difficult interactions at least on a monthly basis. So th those difficult interactions are not uncommon at all. And why, do we, wh why should we talk about difficult interactions? Well, because there are outcomes for both the dentists and for the patients. 
And when a difficult interaction occurs, the evidence seems to suggest that dentists are more prone to error. So they're not string thinking straight. If they're distracted or they're unsettled by a difficult patient or by a piece of equipment that's faulty or, or by uh, the dental assistant who suddenly walks out of the surgery in tears, it can get very difficult. And most of us perform at our best when we're relaxed and comfortable with our patient and with the chair side and with the environment. But that's not always the case. And when we are faced with a difficult interaction, then we know that it will lead to diagnostic error. It will lead to increased stress for the dentist. And in some cases, it ends with suicide. Dentistry is an incredibly stressful occupation. And um, some of the some of the stresses that our members experience lead to mental health issues. And over my career at Dental Protection, I've dealt with one or two situations where um, dentists just couldn't cope, cope anymore and took their life. So not only does it lead to diagnostic error, but it leads to human frailty as well. On the patient side, if the patient participates in a difficult interaction or experience, the evidence suggests that they're not going to have the best treatment outcomes. It's not easy to be at your best if you're feeling uncomfortable with a patient. And re the same research indicates that difficult interactions can lead to a range of outcomes that are unlikely to be beneficial to patients. And some of the patient's behaviors I hear about actually shock me because I, I just don't get this bit is the, the last person I want to fall out with is the guy who's just about to take my pulp out. But sometimes the patient is reacting to the way they've been treated or to what they've been conditioned to. And, and a, a good example I can think of recently was um, a patient complained about the way that they were, they were treated by the practice receptionist said the practice receptionist was rude to them. And if you actually looked at the Google reviews, there were half a dozen Google reviews from other patients who had said that they had also experienced rudeness from the receptionist. So the new patient coming to that practice is already predisposed. They're already thinking that they're going to, that the receptionist is going to be rude to them. And, and that's exactly what happens. It is a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. So sometimes it's the patient is the cause of the problem, but in other times they are re reacting to another problem that's not there, that, that they have not caused. So what sort of stuff are we talking about here? Well, the, the literature and our own experiences tell us that generally the source of the difficulty lies within one or more of these interrelating domains. Um, we may be able to take difficulties arising in one or two of these domains within our stride, but the more domains that come into play in an event, the more difficult it is to manage the interaction effectively, partly because we may have few of our positive factors that we can draw upon to provide us with support. And what we can see here in the slide is that the intersection between all four domains is the high pressure center. That's where all factors overlap, and that's when we have our meltdown. So let's just quickly look at some of the, the patient factors contributing to a difficult interaction. And a lot of our patients nowadays have unrealist, unrealistic expectations. And a, a good example of this is a new patient calls up saying they have a crown out that needs to be re-cemented. They turn up holding their post crown and wanting you to stick it back in. And you have a look at the post crown and you realize the root split and you can't. You can't stick that crown back in. It's happened before to this patient. The last few times they went back to the dentist, it was a simple re-cement job, according to the patient, and they don't understand the difficulty, and that causes a difficult interaction or a difficult conversation. Different interpretations of the same event. This got me thinking about a recent case where um, the dentist saw the patient. The patient had called up asking for contact details of the dentist. Apparently, she'd she'd ended up in hospital diagnosed with meningitis following extraction of an upper left third molar. Um, that's a good example of, of a different interpretation. The patient thought that she got meningitis from an extraction. 
I mean, we know as dentists that that it's very difficult to link viral or bacterial meningitis to an extraction. But in the patient's mind, their interpretation was that it was the extraction and the pain afterwards that led to the meningitis. And then you can have this extreme emotion. And I can remember, um, I can remember having an orthopedic surgeon come into the practice and outwardly he didn't seem particularly anxious, um, but he was. And you would pull out the syringe, do what you thought was a decent block injection. It'd be quite difficult because he'd open his mouth and his tongue would be in the way and you wouldn't be quite certain where you put the local anaesthetic. But as soon as you'd administered the anaesthetic, he'd plaked out, he'd fainted. So you get patients bringing difficult problems and then you have patients who are rigid about regarding alternative options, rigid about how they conduct themselves in the practice. And I had this dreadful lady I treated for years and years and years, and she wouldn't let me put the chair back. And I found it incredibly difficult to manage her dental care because she wouldn't allow me to put the chair back. What she also did is she also placed this very big handbag on the chair between me and her. So I couldn't actually lean across to get into her mouth. So the behaviours of some patients make the interaction very difficult as well. So there are probably many other examples we can all think of, but part of the solution here is recognising that patients don't always understand what we need them to do. They, they don't understand that the tongue thrust makes it more difficult for you to get your hands in their mouth, that working standing up isn't easy that what they hear us say might go in one ear and out the other, that their own anxiety can be a huge distraction. And that when we're on our game, it's much easier to cope with these, but it was never easy to treat Mrs. Marshall. And it was never easy to inject the orthopedic surgeon because I knew every single time it happened, he was going to faint and we were going to have to deal with the faint before we could get him back and do it, carrying out the treatment. So, Let's talk about the second domain, which is condition here. And we're talking about the condition or the problems the patient presents with. And some of them are relatively straightforward, but the more complex ones to manage generally tend to arrive as acute problems. And not everyone is good at raising flaps and removing bone to carefully and safely deliver teeth. You know, I didn't enjoy taking out third molars, but give me a patient with an acute pulp and I had no problem dealing with that. So what are the sort of common problems that you see in the literature that are associated with difficult interactions? Well, there's obviously the patient with a lot of dental disease. There's patients who present with pain and you're just not sure where that pain's coming from. Patients who have a physical disability that makes it tricky for them to even get into the chair, let alone open their mouth wide. So there's, there's lots of things going on apart from just the problem the patient is presenting with. And the, 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 the problem that I had on Tuesday night was my, my phone went ping. And a friend sent me this panoral that you can see on the screen. And this friend used to work for MPS. She's now based in Geneva in Switzerland. And she was asking my advice because she had toothache. So she tells me that she's got toothache on the right hand side of her mouth. She'd been to see the dentist in Geneva and he'd taken this panoral film and they reckon it's the four seven that's causing the tooth and either it needs to be, um, the, the symptoms are significant. The pain is serious enough for it to suggest that it's either going to need um, a root canal treatment or an extraction. And I'm having a look, I think, Mark, you'll need to let me have a look at the x-ray. I have a look at the x-ray and I knew from working with her that she was a broxist. You could look at her masseters and they were popping out of her face. And, and I looked at this 4-7 and I thought, mm, I'm not sure about this. So what I said to her was, I said, look, get some water in your mouth, tilt your right ear down, put cold water in first, and then hot water in afterwards. So she does that. And after she's done the hot water, she says to me, the pain's coming from the tooth at the top right hand side, the fourth tooth from the back. So all of a sudden, we've got a completely different problem going on here. And I'm saying to her, well, look, 
you know, it's a process of elimination. When you go back to your dentist on Friday, you're going to have to say all. You're going to have to say to him all of these things that have happened, and say. How are we going to find the, 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 the cause of the problem? I've been talking to a dentist and the dentist told me, well, you might have to stick some local anesthetic in above the upper four and see what see if the pain goes to find out what it is. Because the worst thing that can happen is that they pull the wrong tooth out or they take a pulp out of the wrong tooth. And so Friday is going to be a difficult interaction. It's not the dentist in Geneva's fault. It's going to be a difficult interaction. It's going to be the patient's fault because she's already asked two or three dentists what they think is going on, and they're not sure either. So the patients present problems with their with, with, with the condition of their mouth. And, and let's look at the system because that's the, the system is the practice, the equipment, the processes that, that we use. And, you know, I see a lot of complaints from patients about lack of courtesy, dentists running late and keeping patients waiting, not getting the wrong phone number, not updating contact preferences in the patient's record card, lab work back, um, lab work that's not fitting. Uh, you blame the technician, but really if, it, if the lab work fits the model, it's difficult to blame the technician. You get double booked. I mean, all of those things are probably out of your control, but they interact to make it incredibly difficult. I had a case recently where um, the dentist told me that uh, they were using local anaesthetic to irrigate the root canal and they were using local anaesthetic to irrigate the root canal rather than hypochlorite because the practice didn't have rubber dam. So that's another system or process error that contributes to a difficult interventional interaction. Alistair, I want to add two things there. Um, yeah, South Africa is currently on stage six load shedding. So that if you have load shedding and, and a lot of patients booked up, then that creates a, a, a problem with the system that you work in. And what I also see is that uh, corporate practices that gives dentists that work for them targets, that financial targets that they need to meet every month um, to reach a certain turnover. And that for me, you know, puts a lot of pressure on the dentist. So I just want to add those two things yeah i think I, I think for me the one thing that got me out of my comfort zone cobus was was that the intersection between all four of these domains and i and we, we haven't yet talked about um ourselves okay because our own behavior can contribute to the problem our own behavior can can contribute to a difficult interaction and i mean there is a little bit of research in this um, from Australia where um, they asked dentists about how, how much they thought they contributed to the difficult interaction and, and mostly the dentist said actually it's got nothing to do with me I'm perfect um, the fault is with the fault is with the practice the fault is with the patient but they had no difficulty in, in identifying the barriers to to problems with treating patients that arose due to the systems, the patients or the process. But what was less obvious to them was the behavioral factors in themselves. And, and you know, that's something that, that happens to us. Um, and we're not particularly well trained to handle difficult patients. And it's, it's, it's all of those things. It's personality traits. It's, it's, it's previous encounters with people, you know, people who turn up late for appointments irritate us. And we got to the point where we knew who the guys were that kept turning up late. So what I would do is I'd say to the, the practice manager, I said, make them, an, give them an appointment card with a time that's 15 minutes before the time that they're actually due. So that if they were 15 minutes, they'd actually be turning up on time. And then the really difficult thing for, for, for us as clinicians when we're working is these things you know the fact that we're hungry the fact that sometimes we're angry with the patients we're angry with ourselves we run late we're tired we've got low energy um we're distracted and the first thing that we need to do as clinicians is be able to recognize and react 
And if you think about it, most patients, if they knew you were hungry, would accept you needed to eat. They wouldn't want you being angry with them either when you're about to undertake a difficult procedure. But they're all, you're already running late. There's another two patients in the waiting room because you've been double booked, but they don't know that. And they, 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 they don't even know that it's not your normal dental assistant. And then she goes and mixes the alginate with warm water and it's setting before you even load the impression tray. And nobody knows you didn't have a good sleep the night before because the neighbor's alarm was going off. It's things like that that, that nobody seems to know about. Um, and probably when we think about the situations we get in as clinicians, the last thing we should be doing right then is treating a patient. But that's what we do because we're dentists and we have superpower and we're professionals and we're supposed to we're supposed to be able to cope with all of this and it's what the patients expect as well as well they don't they don't care as long as they get what they've come for and we put ourselves at risk because we don't have the right strategies to manage those difficult interactions and if only we could stop and say that's it, I'm off home, it's not safe to treat you today or I'm not feeling up to it. It would be, life would be great. But if we do that, it gives the patients an excuse not to turn up when they're not feeling like going to the dentist and we're not gonna any, any, earn any money that way. So we've gotta be able to recognize the difficulties that all four domains create for us. We've also got to recognize the things that affect our performance and we've got to have strategies and tools to deal with them. And that's what you're going to talk about now, Cobus. Yeah, thanks, Alistair. OK, so with the IPL cricket happening as we speak, you know, I can't help to think back uh, to 2008 when the IPL was introduced. You know, it's just my favorite form of cricket, the T20 version. It's, and it's very exciting to watch. The first IPL cricket was held in India in 2008, and my team were the Deccan Chargers, and they were led by the Australian wicketkeeper Adam Gilchrist. In that first year, in 2008, the Deccan Chargers came stone last. And when they interviewed Adam Gilchrist after the last match, all he had to say is that him and his team lacked the skills to cope with this new version of the game. So the next year, the IPL were held in South Africa because of the 2008 Mumbai terrorist attacks. And guess who won the IPL in 2009? The Deccan Chargers, my team, again led by Adam Gilchrist. So guess who worked on their skills? So we also need to work on our skills because our game is also uh, changing every year. We practice in a more litigious environment compared to years ago. Patients are getting more demanding and more informed with the internet. And as Alistair has said, our reactions are getting more difficult. So let's look at some skills that can help us deal with these difficult interactions. So we're going to look at a couple of skills. The first one is the diagnosis of the difficulty. Then I want to talk a little bit about a support and tension model for change. And then lastly, we're going to talk, I'm going to introduce a a model to you that will help you reach. Uh, it's a very simple model that will help you reach the solution uh, in any difficult sort of interaction. So just as there isn't one pill to cure all diseases for blood pressure and diabetes and cancer, there isn't one answer for every difficult situation. It's more about learning several different skills and using them at appropriate times. So the first key skill for me is to be able to recognize and diagnose the difficulty. In most situations, your automatic reaction will most likely tell you that the patient is a nuisance or unrealistic or rude. And it may be correct or incorrect. However, it's not going to help you manage the situation better. So working through a range of questions to help you understand and diagnose the difficulty will help you to move from an automatic response, which will have consequences, to a more considered response. So what and working through those questions, you know, what is the difficulty here? Is it, is it coming from the patient, the condition, the, the practice where I work at the moment, or is it coming from myself, you know? Um, and what is the difficulty? 
and what's the patient's view and how can I approach the difficulty? So working through these questions will prevent you from making a immediate reaction and, and rather give a, a considered response to the patient. To the patient. So I want to talk a little bit about the support and tension model for change. So research shows that to encourage change or a a change in point of view requires appropriate levels of tension and support. Tension, um, informing the, pointing out the problem and the consequences of not acting it, creates tension and informing the patient how to prevent the problem or treat the problem creates support. So let me explain this to you by using a dental example. So if there's no tension or no support, then you have uh, stasis and no growth. If you have too much tension, so let's use a periodontal patient. You diagnose a patient with adult progressive periodontal disease. For that patient to change their habits, like to stop smoking, uh, clean their teeth regularly, uh, use some floss, visit the hygienist now and then, uh, consider uh, being referred to a periodontist, you need to create enough tension. But giving too much tension, for example, if you say to the patient, you're probably going to lose all your teeth in the next month or two, or, you know, how do you kiss your wife with that mouth or something like that will create too much tension and it will lead to regression and you'll probably never see that patient again. The patient will probably go to another practice. Giving too much support uh, will lead to confirmation and no change in behavior. So telling a patient, you've got a bit of a problem with your gum, you come every six months for a clean and you'll be okay, won't lead to any change in that patient's behavior. So to get a patient to uh, change their habits, consider to stop smoking, visit the hygienist, use floss, uh, we need appropriate levels of tension and the and support. And that can be used in any difficult interaction with a patient. So I want to talk a little bit about three supportive skills and two tension raising skills. So the first supporting skill is, is active listening. Patients love being listened to. It shows that you're interested in them and then in their condition. Uh, and we actively listen to a patient by looking at them in the eye and, and nodding and not interrupting them uh, by using open-ended questions and reflecting back what the patient has, has said to you. And the, the, the thing is, people are more likely to listen if they feel that they're being listened to. So the first key supportive skill is to actively listen to our patients. The next one is to provide empathy. Empathy uh, is a very powerful tool that can be used in any difficult interaction. And it's all about the patient's perception of being heard and understood. So it's not the same as sympathy. Sympathy is, is just a f that you feel sorry for someone. It's a, f it's a feeling, whilst empathy is all about the patient's experience. So patients experience empathy when you actively listen to them and that you summarize and reflect back uh, the events and the emotions. And then lastly is reframing. Now reframe is actually a, a term that they use in psychology where you would consider an alternative explanation for the patient's behavior and in doing so it will reduce your own stress. What's interesting about reframing is it doesn't necessarily have to be true. Uh, for example, Alistair talked about the patient that keeps on coming in late for their appointment and that that might make you angry. So considering that the patient might be using public transport, uh, which makes it difficult to arrive in time or that the patient needed to arrange with some babysitters to look after their kids or that the patient's employer um, didn't want to let them go will help you to manage your own emotion by reframing um, the, the, the problem. Okay, then if we go to tension raising skills, the first thing that will create tension is to acknowledge and agree on what the problem is. You to verbalize your assessment of the difficulty uh, 
to use Alistair's example about the, the patient with the tongue, the orthopedic <laughs> patient that passes out, uh, you know, talk to them about agree on what the difficulty is and get their own views on it. And that sort of creates tension with your patients because they don't like to talk about what the difficulty is. And then the next tension raising skill is to raise, raise your boundaries. You know what you're prepared to do and what you're not prepared to do as a dentist. And raising boundaries also increases tension because patients realize that they we won't necessarily get what they expected on that visit. So those are the two tension raising skills that we can use. And if we introduce this AID model to you, uh, it stands for acknowledge the patient's position. So we use our supportive skills, the active listening, the empathy and the reframing to acknowledge and understand the patient's position. Then we use our tension raising skills to inform them about our position and then we discuss the way forward. So if we look at each one of these sections in detail, so we use our uh, supportive skills to actively listen to the patient's concerns, to summarize their positions and their feelings to show that you understand um, and to check that your understanding is right. Then we use, so an example would be, so John, you're not convinced that you have a problem with your gums. You wonder why I'm the first dentist who has told you this and you sound a bit irritated. Is that right? And then we use our tension raising skills to inform them about our position and our boundaries. And we acknowledge the difficulty in the interaction. So an example, as I explained, I found a lot of gum disease in your mouth. And because of this, I don't believe it would be in your best interest to do the veneers you want right now. So we have a bit of difficulty, don't we? And then lastly, we need to discuss the way forward. And the, the key here is to ask the patient to suggest possible solutions. Uh, to get them involved in the discussion about the options. And patients may need significant encouragement to do this because they usually want you as a dental professional to come up with suggestions. You studied for six years at university, right? It's not, it's your job to tell me what to do. Uh, so you as a dental professional may list then some supplement options that you think might work and talk through all those options discuss possibilities and agree on a mutually acceptable option within your boundaries. And that process demonstrates a team approach and it relieves you as a practitioner of the sole responsibility or the solution maker. So an example, I'd like to know what ideas you have about what we can do in this situation. I'm really keen to know first what possibilities you can think of so that I know what's important to you and afterwards, I may be able to add a few ideas too. And let's just list out all the options first and then discuss them uh, once we work through them. And that's the beauty of the AID model. It's a very simple model, but it can be used in any difficult situation. You know, the bullying patient, the internet expert, the patient who unreasonably insists on certain things, the patient with facial pain that you can't diagnose, like the one we Alistair showed the x-ray, the patient with periodontal disease who convinced that there's nothing wrong with them, the mother whose child has a lot of caries, but it's everyone else's fault. Any difficult situation, uh, this model works really well. So what happens, let's look at the common pitfalls when using this model. The first one is not clearly defining and agreeing on the problem. You have to diagnose the problem and agree on it. And then the next one is not to involve the patient in the decision making process. And then the last one is being unclear about your boundaries. You need to communicate your boundaries very clear to the patients. Patients will always tend to push your boundaries for their own convenience. So what happens if you can't reach a, an acceptable option that's agreeable to the patient and within your boundaries. And the answer is let the patient solve the problem for you. You know, one option is to terminate the terminate the relationship with the patient. You might not be a, the right dentist for that patient, but if you go that route, you should definitely consult with dental protection 
or with uh, the legal um, team at SADA because a decision like that have uh, significant dental legal risk. So examples of that would be, I'm sorry that we haven't been able to find the way forward. It seems uh, that I might not be the right dentist for you currently. Would you like me to suggest another dentist? Or I'm disappointed that we haven't been able to, gr to agree on an option. What do you think we should do now? Or I'm very disappointed that we've not been able to get something working today. If you can think of any other options that we could work on, then please let me know. So if you can just summarize what me and Alistair talked about, you know, difficult interactions can arise because of factors in the coming from the patients, ourselves, or the place where we work. And these difficult interactions have significant impact on us as professionals. But choosing skillful action in the best interest of the patient can significantly improve the outcome of a difficult interaction. We can manage these interactions uh, more effectively by recognizing and diagnosing the difficulty, using a range of skills we just talked through, and remaining focused on working towards an effective solution in the best interest of the patient and not getting involved in unnecessary uh, disagreements or arguments with our patients. And the AID model is a model that is a very simple model that helps you to be solution focused. It can be used for minor and major difficulties and it'll prompt you to pay attention to listen to the patient and summarize their perspective first before you state your position clearly. And it'll help you to facilitate a discussion on possible solutions and future care. And at this point, I'm going to hand back to you, Alistair. Yeah, thanks, Corbus. Um, really helpful. I like I like the the AID model. I use that quite a lot. I use it at work, dealing with difficult interactions with other colleagues as well. It's just a really sensible way of dealing with the problem. And there there is one question from Doctor Kasun here that obviously the the AID model obviously would work quite well here. Um, and the question is, how does one deal with a patient who insults your assistant by saying, for example, that she's not doing a good job because I'm drowning here? Okay. Now, I mean, it, it's very easy to get frustrated with a patient who's who can't cope with the suction in their mouth or the buildup of water or something because not not everybody's good at that and sometimes they're going to think okay is this the prob is this a problem that is being caused by the patient or is it a problem that that I'm causing or the assistant is causing and it may be that that it 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 it's just a normal amount to build up of water for that patient and it may be that you need to look for a different strategy and it may be that the best way to help that patient cope with it is to use a rubber dam for the the part of the treatment that you're using water or it may be that there's too much water coming out of your handpiece i don't know but i think the aid model works beautifully there where the patient says hang on a minute i'm drowning and you've got to stop first of all to let them catch their breath and then to acknowledge the problem inform them what you're trying to do and then work for a solution and i think that that that's a perfect example of how the AID model works. I don't know if it answers Dr. Kasun's question, but I think if a patient says that they're drowning, it's generally because there's a lot of water in their mouth and they're not able to breathe. And the, and and it and it's us. It's it's the dental team that's putting the water in their mouth, and we've got to find a solution to that. Yes, from my side, you know, I also use the AID model a lot with the complaints that I uh, at SARA that I try and resolve with angry patients. But in, in Dr. Kasun's case, you know, just an acknowledgement to show that, that you understand that the patient is experiencing discomfort and then informing them uh, about the difficulty of the procedure that you're busy using. Um, and then look at talking through the options, like like Alistair said, m maybe sit a little bit more upright or introducing rubber dam or, or things like that. And uh, yeah. You could, you could always switch the water off and overheat the pulp, <laughs> Cobus. That would be another <laughs> yeah. way of dealing yeah. with the problem. But yeah. uh, 
but you 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 gain so much trust and and you take the, the the tension of the interaction by just acknowledging what the patient is going through you know and if the patient see look this guy understands that this is really uncomfortable but he can't do something about that at the moment then it all, you already have the patient on your side uh, so it, it just takes the tension of the interaction if you really acknowledge what the patient is going through look i understand this is really difficult for you and i can see that you're having trouble breathing but this is my difficulty that i'm encountering at the moment and, and, and what you, are we going to do about it and you, can, and you can say to them look i can use the rubber dam but it'll cover your mouth and your nose and then you won't be able to breathe at all so <laughs> you, you can come up with all sorts of silly solutions but yeah good and and i think there's a there's another um question by an anonymous attendee and it's about what are the risks involved with terminating a relationship with a patient and again i think this is absolutely perfect for the AID model. And I think, you know, what, what are the legal risks of terminating a relationship with a patient? Well, let's not think too legalistic about this. Let's think about sort of the ethics of the situation. And, and if we're, we're not forced to continue to treat people that we are uncomfortable treating, but there's got to be a really good reason and an attempt to do something before you reach the point where the relationship breaks down. But the, it, it's this, it, it, it's when tr trust goes in the relationship that you've got to do something about it. And you've just got to, you, you've got to inform a patient, you've got to have this conversation that where, where you, you, you say to them, look, it's not in your best interest for me to continue treating you because I'm being distracted by the difficulty of the interaction or I'm not going to be able to do my best work because you're sitting up, you, may, you, you, you want to sit up and I can't get in a position to treat you and maybe I'm not the dentist for you. But I think we've got, we've got to be very careful about ending professional relationships because we're expected to be able to deal with difficult patients and that's why we're having this discussion this evening to give you some tips rather than to close the door on the patient and say i only want easy patients to treat nobody said dentistry was particularly going to be particularly easy and i think there is a general expectation by the hpcsa that we are able to cope with the difficulty some patients bring yeah yeah so what i see uh, at the work i do for sara is patients starting a treatment plan and then things to, don't go according to plan with with that treatment plan and and in the middle of a treatment plan when complication starts to arise or when when the dentist can't meet the patient's expectation then the dentist says look i maybe i'm not the right dentist for you but there's definitely risks involved in in refusing treatment in the middle of a treatment plan because you think you're not the right dentist for that patient and that's why you need to consult with someone like alice <laughs> before you make such a decision uh, that you're not the right dentist for the patient in the middle of a treatment plan or following a treatment plan you know Cobus, one of the th why we're on on the 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 conversation about the AID model. I think that you almost touched upon this example, but the situation where where you see a new pa new patient comes to you, they had a checkup six months ago. You look in their mouth, you take some bite wing X rays, and you realise they've got active periodontal disease and they've got six cavities. And you say to them, "Okay, right, had a good look around your mouth. Here's." This what I found, here's the treatment plan. And the patient says, well, this has come as a real surprise because I only had a checkup six months ago. And um, my dentist who saw me then said, I didn't need any treatment. How could this be possible? Uh, and and that's where, you know, the, the, there's the element of doubt coming into, into the relationship, into the interaction, that this patient actually doesn't trust what you're telling them. And And then, and then you say to them, well, here's the evidence you show them the x-rays and and they will say how could this be possible how come my last dentist didn't pick this up and you're not sure what to say there and you can't you can't comment 
You cannot comment. You can, you, you, you've got no idea why somebody missed it. They might not have taken bite wings. They might have taken bite wings. They might have lost them. They might not have told the patient. There could be all sorts of reasons. And the only thing you can do in a situation like that is use the, 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 the AID model, discuss a solution. And the best solution is, I can't comment on what the last dentist didn't or didn't do. Maybe you should speak to them. And I'm happy to give you copies of the x-rays that I've taken that show the six cavities that I've picked up. Yeah, yeah, just acknowledging that it's really distressing for the patient to get the bad news because they obviously didn't expect it. And then informing them about your position, what, what you see on the x-rays and, and in their mouths, and then really just discuss the options. And the trick here is to ask the patient, what do you think we should do from, from you and get the patient involved in the and the discussion. So another question here about um, how do you deal with the patient who's who's overtly obese and has broken the mainspring on my dental chair previously? So just, the patient's just too big to get into the dental chair. And I guess what happens if you try and move the chair backwards, it topples over if, it, if the spring doesn't break. So I don't know if you've had any patients contacting you as the mediator, Cobra, saying that they've been refused to be seen by the dentist because they're too big to fit in the chair. <laughs> but there obviously, there obviously are, there, there obviously are, there, there obviously some people who are just too big to fit in a chair, just like they're too big to fit in 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 an in a in an airliner seat. You know, the, the it, it, and it's and it's not about discrimination; it's about fact. You just cannot get in there. <laughs> yeah, and like you said earlier, you know, you, you might be able to handle the obese patient on a good day, but you, when you're also having a bad day, when your chair breaks, there's load shedding, you're working with a new assistant, you, you had a bad night and a disagreement with your wife, and all these things overlap, it's then that you uh, sort of react rather than respond and uh, yeah, tell the patient to find another dentist or something. I, I mean, that's probably not the most helpful piece of advice we've given out tonight, but I, I, I mean, you, you learn by error and it has happened to me where I've got some, some enormous guy in my, in my chair, tilted it back. So it was about, I don't know, three quarters of the way back and the thing falls over. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you you can all you can also tell the patient that your chair can only go up to a maximum of ninety kilograms. So maybe you should consider another dentist with a different chair that can accommodate one hundred and fifty kilograms. I'm, I I am presuming there is a solution for that because, like everything else, I mean the 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 manufacturers are, may well be manufacturing chairs. But if you've got a colleague that's got a chair that's more robust than the one you've got, then it's not discriminating to say to the patient. Look, this chair's not going to work. How how he, how how heavy are you? What two hundred and fifty kgs? Right, you need to go and see Doctor Barnard because he's got the chair that can cope with you. But it's it's not discrimination. It is a fact that the chair is not built to support somebody of that weight. Yeah, and that's raising the tension, stating your boundary, <laughs> your chair's boundary. Yeah. Okay. So so next question up is where do we draw the line? between between being assertive with the patient and being rude? Well, the thing is that as a professional, you, you, you can't really be rude to your patient, but the, the key here is to ac acknowledge the patient's position first and, and, and it shows that you understand why they react or respond the way you do. And just by doing that, you, you decrease the whole tension on the whole interaction and then stating your boundaries and, and your diagnosis of the difficulty and then giving the situation back to the yeah. patient to suggest solutions. You know, you've stated your boundaries and you're not prepared to treat outside those boundaries. Um, and then the patient, the patient needs to come up with the solution. Yeah, you, but, you, but I mean, but I talk a lot about rudeness in, in my presentations because you will find that word rude in almost every complaint letter. Patients experience rudeness from, from dentists and dentists experiencing rudeness from patients that affect the way they treat those patients. So rudeness is, uh, is something that a professional should never uh, be to a patient. But yeah. pre presumably, Cobus, we're, we're not rude to all our patients, okay? So rudeness happens when, when 
if we think about the four domains again, all of the things that conspire to to make the interaction very difficult. And I guess rudeness is rudeness can be um, it 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 can be a form of emotion. You know, it may be, it that that's how you're feeling. You end up being rude to the patient. You don't intend to be rude to the patient, but it's recognizing all the different things that are interacting to create that frustration in you that leads to your rudeness. And that, and it's again, it's about understanding how you react. But you know, where do you draw the line between being assertive with the patient and rude? I mean, I mean, you don't. Ne I mean. It, I don't know if we need to, I'd hope we don't need to be assertive. Yes, you need to increase tension in the relationship, but, you know, assertiveness is is sort of a word that I would put more alongside paternalistic behavior as well. Um, and we've kind of moved from that. It's, you know, this, this, the relationship with patients is a joint one. We're both equals in the relationship. Um, uh, and we both have needs out of to get things out of the relationship, but I don't think we should be. We we as being assertive is necessarily something that you need to be. There needs to be something that's gone wrong before that for you to be assertive, or to be to have to be assertive. And I mean, I I don't know. I mean, the 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 kind of things that used to wind me up were. The patients would come in with three or four kids and the kids would be running riot in the practice and you know you're not sure whether whether the parents are going to take offense to say can you not bring your pick your kids or it, it it you know you've got to have a you, you've got to have a conversation with them and say look this is not working well maybe next time when you make an appointment can you have somebody look after the kids so that we can really focus on the dentistry yeah the thing is, being rude is, is a reaction. It's an automatic reaction. It's not a considered response. And automatic reactions like rudeness have consequences. And one of the consequences is a breakdown in relationship and an increased risk of a complaint. So it's much better to work through those questions and, and respond in a, in a professional way uh, than to try and be assertive and, and be rude. Kobus, you, I mean, you, you say that um, many of your cl complaints from patients include maybe a complaint about the dentist or a member of staff being rude. Do, do the patients who are making the complaint about the, the rude dentist or the rude member of staff understand what has happened to, for the, the, the they understand all the all the, the the difficulties that create the rudeness. Are they aware of the problems that they've caused? Well, they're aware when they receive the correspondence from me. Then they are aware of the of the problem. But does does the patient understand what the, with the how they've contributed to it? I think that was my point. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't think always that because patients expect uh, professionals and professional practices to to. Uh, act and respond in a certain way, right? Very rightly so. And if if dentists or their staff are rude, then that is a predisposing factor for a complaint. Because as a professional person and a professional practice, you know, being rude isn't part of who we should be. I think. Yeah, uh, it's 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 not yeah. something that we necessarily want to happen. But but I but I guess if it does happen, if you feel that you're about to be rude to somebody, then you've got to got to manage yourself and manage it by using that AID model again. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and and, cool. and you can you can state your boundaries uh, in a very nice way with a smile on your face. You don't have to be assertive or rude to state your boundaries. Uh. Can we can we talk about supersession, Corbus? Because that's something that keeps coming up, and I think everybody gets worried about supersession. There's there there's there there's some difficulties in understanding why patients move and what your responsibilities are. And I think it, it is it is important to make sure everybody understands that supersession only occurs when a patient moves to another practitioner and they are still under treatment with you. If if 
if they move to another practitioner and they and you're not in the middle of a course of treatment that's not supersession so supersession occurs when a patient moves to a new dentist when they're in the middle of the course of treatment when they're in the middle of having some crowns done or they're in the middle of having a root canal done that's when supersession happens and when you, when you mediate complaints Gobus, what are the what are the what are the issues that come up around supersession, or the or, or the miss the, the the things that we we actually don't get right when we think about it? Yeah. So what I see is that patients lose trust in in their dentist in the middle of a treatment plan, and then decides to go to another dentist for a second opinion and to continue treatment. And then the first dentist is very offended and unhappy with the fact that the patient uh, is walking around with temporary crowns and then goes to another dentist to continue their treatment. And then you've got this whole issue between patient autonomy because the patient has a right to choose where he or she goes for his treatment versus supersession, the next dentist taking over the treatment because the patient don't want to go back to the first dentist uh, because the dentist has been rude to them or hurt them or uh, things like that. So then you've got this supersession versus patient autonomy. And, and I see that quite often with the, with the mediation and, and you can help us maybe a little bit about the dental legal sort of issues with supersession versus autonomy, which one trumps uh, when, so, when that... Yeah, I think... I mean, the, the 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 ethical rules around supersession are, are were were promulgated, were drafted to take into account the problem of patients wanting to move to a different practitioner and not having to pay again for the same investigations, the same reports, the same X-rays. So I don't think they were necessarily thinking about dentistry and dental patients moving. I think they were probably thinking about general surgery and medical complex medical procedures where patients lost confidence in their practitioner and moved to another practitioner so the idea that the rules around supersession is that if you if you are the practitioner who is superseding the one before there is an obligation on you to contact that practitioner and say the patients come to you and can can can, can you provide copies of reports or x-rays or CBCT scans so the patient doesn't have to, so the patient's not penalized financially and 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 overdosed with radiation for having to have the same investigations done that were carried out with the last dentist two weeks ago. I think that's what, what, what they're trying to avoid happening. Um, but this, the, I mean, if you, if you look at the constitution, the right to confidentiality trumps just about everything in healthcare relationships. And if the patient comes to you and says, patient leaves me, turns up at your practice and say, Alistair couldn't get me numb. He was doing a molar. He hurt me every time. I've had enough of him. Would you carry on, Cobus? And and you'll say, yes, I'm happy to, to, to carry on with your treatment, but I'm required to tell Alistair that you've come here. And then I say, well, I don't want Alistair knowing that you've taken over my care. And, and I think that the, the right to confidentiality, to respect the autonomy of the patient trumps any ethical rule for, for you to phone me up and say, um, I've got Dr. Kasun sitting in my chair. Um, he doesn't want... Um, you to tell Alistair that he's moved. So I think I think we've got we we've we've got to be very very aware that that patient confidentiality is incredibly important and more so with the advent of Poppy. So we've we've got another question here. Um, some patients only come for emergency problems. They refuse to allow you to take x-rays and think we just want to make more money. Can we refuse to treat those individuals? And, you know, I have a big issue about that because I see, I see dentists getting into difficulty because the patient's demands undermines what they would normally do. So if, a pay, if you need, if you need to, if you need, to take an x-ray to confirm a diagnosis or to assist with treatment and the patient says I don't want you to take an x-ray because I'm not prepared to pay for it you've got a problem okay because if you proceed without the x-ray you may make a mistake okay 
if you if you if you if you say to the patient, I cannot proceed without an X-ray, then you give the decision back to the patient. So you explain to them what the problem is, tell them, I can't do this work without an X-ray. This is why an X-ray is required. If you don't want me to take it, I'm probably not the best dentist for you. You need to go to somebody else. And I think that's the approach we need to be taking. That's when th this, there's a degree of assertiveness in there, but it's, it's not allowing yourself to be clinically undermined by treatment that's driven by the patient's apprehension or, or concerns about how much money you're making out of them. They have to understand that if an X-ray is needed as part of or to confirm a diagnosis or to assist with treatment, it is absolutely necessary. And if, the, if, if something goes wrong and you haven't got an X-ray, it matters not whether the patient says that that, that you, you, you weren't allowed to take an x-ray. That's not going to happen because you have to have that conversation with the patient and say, it is not safe for me to proceed. Yeah, and the AID model works beautifully for yep. that because you just acknowledge uh, that the patient's position, you know, you can understand that they're not prepared to pay the extra 150 rand for the x-ray or they might have health concerns about the x-ray, the radiation and stuff. But your position is that you, you cannot make a proper diagnosis without an x-ray and you need one. So what are the options, you know, and give it back to the patient. One option is to go and see another dentist who's prepared to make a diagnosis without x-rays. <laughs> you know, one option is to pay the x-ray off over two months and, and things like that discuss the options okay um Matt, we've got lots of questions now Cobus. let's try and 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 get through some of these um i'm not sure when sada will have timed the ending of the, the webinar but i'm happy to keep going if you are to work through them and if all our guests want to hang, want to stay with us then we'll try and get through these questions as, as quickly as we can so patients often don't tell you that they've been to a dentist recently and they're still under treatment i don't know i mean i mean when when we say they're still under treatment it ought to be fairly obvious that they're still under treatment so they so you know they've 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 got a cost estimate that's got treatment planned or you look in their mouth and you can see that something's only got a temporary crown on it but you know it's it's you know I, I'm, I'm saying the rules and supersession are not to my mind not as important as we probably think they are and and I and I I think there is there is always a defense for a practitioner that takes over a new patient in in that they would have been breaching the patient's confidentiality if they had contacted the the previous dentist and then you know if the patient doesn't tell them that they they're still under treatment then they don't have a supersession problem either so here we go um Dr. Noday, if you intercede treatment from a colleague in the same practice, do you still need to inform your colleague or do you only need to inform if they come from another practice? I mean, the, the ethical rules don't make a distinction there, but I can see a situation where patient might move. I can, I can remember um, when, I, when the, one of the earlier jobs I had as an associate, I was working with a guy who had an MSc in cons and a number of other qualifications. And there's obviously some patient lost confidence in my ability. And before I knew it, the next appointment she'd booked was with the boss and she hadn't said anything. And, you know, these things happen. So if, if, you, if you take over treatment for a call from a colleague in the same practice, I guess they're probably that it's going to be difficult not to have a conversation about it but you would have you would discuss it with the patient first you would say look why have you moved are you okay for me to talk to dr barnard about why you've moved and that sort of thing i think that as long as you as as long as you've got the patient's permission to have a conversation with your colleague i don't think there's a problem there yeah, and it's also about having good re good relationships with your colleagues. You know, what would you expect your colleague to do if he or she sees one of your patients? You know, do you expect them to discuss it with you, or uh, would you be happy if they don't tell you about it? So, okay, here's here's another one. This is from uh, this 
there's lots of dentists called Dr. Anonymous attendee tonight, isn't there, Cobus? So, <laughs> so it's Dr. AA. I work in a contracted out practice. A colleague in the same practice has left and many of his patients are medical aid patients. They want to move to me, but still want medical aid rates. I'm struggling with how to explain to them that my charges are not medical aid rates. Any tips on how to adequately manage this? I mean, I, we, we talked about this before we came on about, for some reason, dentists are not great at talking to patients about money and and they they often leave the discussion about the cost of treatment to other people in the practice and and it, and it's interesting because patients make a deci make decisions about what treatment they're going to have based on the options available to them an understanding of the kind of risks and benefits of each option and the cost of each option so I don't understand how a patient can leave the treatment room having agreed to have a root canal rather than an extraction and then to go to and then on the way out of the surgery be told about the cost then they're having to make the decision again or they might say oh, oh, oh I didn't know it was going to cost that much I'm going to have my tooth taken out so I think I think talking money is it's difficult for dentists. I think the reason why it's difficult is because we don't want to be rejected by patients because we've quoted them too much. And, and generally that doesn't happen. I think most patients generally appreciate the conversation. And, and, I, and I think in this situation, you know, we're all independent contractors. We're not having to charge the same fee. Your colleague may be contracted in, but you, you just have to have that conversation. Either you'd see those patients at medical aid rates or you, you, you you say to them the, what your charge situation is. I, I don't know if there's anything else that you would do in that situation, Cobus. Yeah, again, the aid model would work brilliantly there because you first acknowledge the patient's request that they want to be seen on medical aid rates, but then you inform them about your position and you state your boundaries. And if uh, they not to if they're not prepared to be treated within your boundaries, which is your fee scale, then perhaps the, they should find another dentist or yeah, or, that, so. or that's the option you know if they want to see you this is your fee yeah okay and that and that's an area where we probably can be assertive we can say this is my fee structure this is what i charge if you want to see me this is what you're going to be charged but i i think for you know we're we're really good at treatment but we're not that great about having conversations of about money and cost and if and it, and if we delegate that to another member of the team, we've got to make sure that the other that that person uh, it, it, it has been trained up and is competent to manage the conversation and 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 probably use the AID model. Yeah, uh, well, talking about financial consent, I mean, about you can safely say about forty percent of the complaints that we work with at SADA over the last eight years is because there's a misunderstanding about how much treatment would cost. And obviously, who's responsible for the cost when there's medical aids involved or third party funders. Um, so financial consent is a, is a very key issue to make sure that you do that right in your practice. And talking to your patients about how much treatment's going to cost is one of the most important parts of that. Yeah. You know, and, and once once you have a treatment written treatment plan that the patient signs, then that's all you need because that's what the first thing any third party will be interested in when there's a dispute about fees um, is, a, is a signed treatment plan with showing the costs. So, I mean, this, um, I guess, takes us on to the other question of how you know whose responsibility is it to make sure that the benefits of treatment are available i mean i've always my understanding is that is that it's actually the patient's responsibility to make sure that the treatment is authorized by their medical aid and if it's not then they have to pay for it themselves with their own with their own money okay but but as a courtesy what i'm seeing is i'm seeing dentists take over take responsibility for contacting the patient's medical aid to get the authorization and and quite often you can get a green light or there's sufficient funds at the time the authorization is sought but actually when the claim is submitted the funds have been depleted is is, is that a commonly occurring problem cobus 
Yes, what, what you definitely see is that patients contact SADA because they, they cannot afford treatment and they feel that they've been misled by the practice administration that the medical aid would pay for the fee for the crown, say for example a crown. Uh, your practice manager phones the patient to say the procedure has been authorized, they can come in for the crown and then when they come in for the crown and, and the practice claim the the money from the medical aid and the medical aid don't pay for the crown because the patient's wife has been to see the optician uh, for some new glasses who came out of the same pool of funds then the patient goes back and say look if i knew i'm gonna have to swipe my credit card for this procedure i would have never proceeded you told me that the medical aid would pay for this treatment and that it's it's not it's not going to cost me anything so yeah, but I mean, it is always the patient's legal responsibility. Uh, they are the clients and they have the contract with the medical aid to establish benefits and to make sure that the correct pre-authorization uh, is in place for any procedure. But the problem comes, like you said, Alistair, when, when, they've, when they're being misled, when, the, when we as dental practices try to help with the authorization. Um, and then we burn our fingers because we, patients say, uh, turn it back at us and say, look, you told me that the medical aid would pay for this. And if I knew this procedure is going to cost me 5,000 Rand, I would have asked you to remove my tooth. Kobus, um, there's another, que another question by Dr. AA. Um, Following up on the terminating relationships, if a patient is very aggressive or appears to be in that they walk in the room and immediately start demanding a specific treatment to which you try to be understanding, but then after many conversations, they're still aggressive and you don't feel comfortable doing any treatment because of the behavior of the patient, as the patient makes you feel very uncomfortable, is it acceptable to explain you might not be the best dentist and recommend another dentist? I mean, this is this is this kind of problem of you know patients need to understand that for us to be on our game, we need to be relaxed, comfortable treating the patient, comfortable with the person attached to the mouth, and when we are not, then we're not likely to produce our best dentistry. Okay, and. And and it and it's such a close relationship we have with our patients. I mean, you're in their mouth, the the sensory zone, and they're giving you a lot of grief. And we've got to keep our hands still, and we've got to. There's all sorts of things that we've that that can distract us from doing the job in hand. And I think I don't like giving answers to questions about can I say no to seeing this patient because the context can be very difficult. Some people are really good at ignoring and putting up with difficult patients and other people aren't so good at doing that. But I think I think the bottom line is is that is that if you genuinely feel that you can't treat that patient safely, then you probably aren't the right dentist for them. They may never find a dentist that's right for them if they're insecure about being ripped off or, or whatever. But if you genuinely feel that there is a safety issue created by the patient's conduct that's not going to end well, then you need to tell them that. You know, you, you don't have to... to, to, to criticize them or get the police you just got to have a, a conversation at their level and say do you do you realize that this is the impact of of your behavior and i'm only at my best with x y and z and therefore it's actually in your interest it's your interest to go somewhere else where there isn't this tension yeah but i guess the trick is to to word it in such a way that it is in the patient's best interest yeah, to, so find, to find another dentist. Yeah, so they actually say, actually, he's got a point there or she's got a point there. I say, yeah. I, now, I now understand this, okay? But, you know, I think it's difficult to put the hand up and say, no, you're not coming in here because we think you're aggressive. But I think, you know, and I, I'm, I'm sure you have kind of zero tolerance policies in South Africa as well in your dental practices and and the, the, the within the the national 
the National Health Act in South Africa, there is some statute and some leg legislation that patients must behave and treat the healthcare practitioners with respect uh, and, and behave accordingly and comply with the rules of the establishment. And if they don't comply with the rules of the establishment and they know what the rules are, then I think you're well within your rights to get to, to withdraw from care or remove them from the practice. So, um, any any other issues that we, we thought we'd discuss, Cobus? I mean, I think that I'm looking at, at the questions. I think we've picked up most of them. Um, <laughs> right, we've got one from Dr. Yash and I do. I don't know who he is. He says he's enjoyed the talk tonight with, when we'll give the AID model a try at work. <laughs> uh, uh, well, anyway. Okay, right. Okay. Cobus. Thank you very much for sharing the last hour and 15 minutes with me. I hope that um, that everyone's enjoyed. Um, here we go. Surely dentists are not supposed to be subject to abuse by patients. Absolutely not. And that's why there is provision within the National Health Act that says that patients must treat the, the establishment and the provider with respect and fall and comply with the rules of the establishment. So no, you're not supposed to be subjected to abuse by patients. And you know, I can't think of anything worse of going and poking a dentist with a stick before they're about to stick a needle in your mouth or or yeah. or, or stick a turbine in your tooth or pull a tooth out. I you know that's it's not a very sensible thing to do. It's like poking a bear, isn't it? You make them angry. So Great, thank you very much, um, Cobus. Th thanks. Oh, here we go. We've got another one. They're still coming in. Um, we've got one here. The medical aid model in South Africa was de designed incorrectly from the beginning. The patients have no idea on medical codes. For them to get authorization or check funds, normally them as frustrated as us clinicians. That's why we do the courtesy, knowing it will go easier. Because we're trained in the clinical code system, the medical aid system is the biggest contributor to this issue. Well, I don't think we're going to disagree with that, are we? I mean, I, I mean, the, 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 the number of codes you guys have is mind-blowing. I mean, it, it's absolutely mind-blowing. But but I guess that I don't know what you do as a patient when you're given a cost estimate with all the codes on it, or or you 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 you're given a receipt. I mean, presumably you send send a copy of the cost estimate to your medical scheme, and they reimburse you. Yeah, but sometimes the medical aid requires X-rays and um, theater authorization numbers and all that. So inevitably, the practice gets involved. But ultimately, it's the patient's responsibility to make sure that the authorization is in place, that the account is settled in full, that the patient has the correct, uh, that the practice has the correct contact details to communicate information about outstanding accounts, things like that. Uh, and, and and then we've finally got a message from Dr. Fricky Redlinghuis and and Fricky, uh, I don't know what you're doing at a young dentist council meeting because young could not be an adjective that's applied to you, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's brilliant. So I I I, I don't know if um, there's anyone there from head office, but maybe they want us to stop talking now. I I don't know. But there's still 271 participants on the webinar, so if you want us to keep going, um, we will do. Um, maybe not. So here we go. From SADA head office to all panellists, thank you for a great session. Have a good evening further. So it looks like the curtain's coming down on tonight, but we've enjoyed it. If the YDC want us to do um, some more talks on different subjects, managing diff difficult interactions is just one of many things that we've probably helped lots of dentists and patients with over the years. So there's other things that we can talk about. Um, and um, through your council, you just need to ask uh, what's this? There are three things that one needs to know about aging. <laughs> yes. Okay, now I'm not going any further down this topic. As <laughs> soon I know what the ending is going to be, and it's not going to be yeah. repeatable here. Okay, yeah. so Cobus, I, um, I guess that's that. That's has reached the end here, um, and and I'll see you sometime. And hopefully, a lot of um, our the delegates on. The webinar tonight will be at the SADA Congress uh, in Cape Town, where we should be. And we look forward to 
catching you all then. So um, back to head office. Good night, everyone.